Welcome back to SuperCloud 4, where we're exploring the impact of generative AI. In particular, we're interested in the disruption potential of AI, the importance of quality data, and how organizations can protect their IP and still keep pace with market movements. With me is Jeff Boudreau, the Chief AI Officer at Dell Technologies. Jeff, good to see you. Thanks for good coming to into you. the studio. Thank you for having me. Yeah, you're welcome. So new role, uh, how come Dell decided we got to appoint a chief AI officer and, and you, you, you must be a popular guy. Yeah, popular guy right now. Uh, a lot of interest after we announced it. Um, I just stepping back in regards to uh, uh, how we're thinking about AI and specifically Gen AI as we go forward. Um, you know, it's a defining technology of our era. We, we truly believe that. And if you think about where uh, the industries are going and what is being used for Gen AI and how it's disrupting how, how you know, our everyday lives and how people use the technology and how business operate. Um, we think it's extremely important uh, for us to have focus and dedicated leadership in this space. Uh, specifically, as I would say, the, uh, the boards in the C-suites are basically shifting all the money to all AI projects. We thought it was important to really make sure that we had the proper leadership and focus in place at Dell. Well, no question. I mean, we've reported on this. It's like it's not like the top line is all you know growing. The IT spending. It's not like mm -hmm. CEOs going, oh, just spend like you used to in 2020. It's not happening like that. So AI is really stealing from some of these other initiatives. But but what excited you about this role? Why Jeff Boudreau? Sure. And before I go into that, I guess to hit your last point, yes, I'm definitely seeing some. Uh, as you would say, stealing from one project to another yep. to really fund this and get this going. But I actually see over the long run, I think it's a huge opportunity for growth and expansion of our TAM, but also the set of services. So from hardware to software to services, it really brings it all together and actually expands our TAM and our opportunity to really help our customers. Now, what it got me excited about the role, it's all about tech. Uh, you, you know, long background, I have, uh, I guess a good mix of both business and technology background, and I have a long track record of, of leadership. So if you think over the last four years of leading ISG, merging Dell and EMC uh, storage teams together, taking over compute storage network, uh, leading and driving the industry leading technologies and infrastructure you know, across the, the, the domains, obviously running large businesses, the team was over 25,000 strong. So I've drove plenty of transformation initiatives. And this was something that we looked at as, as the new role. So the opportunity to take tech and business, merge those together to really provide a better outcome for Dell, but also for our customers is really, really exciting. What does a chief AI officer do at Dell? <laughs> it's a great question. Uh, it's, I would say it's early innings as a baseball person. Uh, we're in early days, so it's evolving uh, in regards to the definition and the industry. If you kind of look, as we just talked about, you look in the industry, you'd say in the uh, heavy technology company, usually it's a very technology centric type person. Um, if you look in other industries, uh, maybe in commerce, you'll see more of a business and marketing slant to this type of role. So they're evolving depending on the industry and the type of company you are. Uh, for me specifically, my role in the company is to, is to define and refine our AI strategy. Uh, it's about setting governance, policy, practices, guardrails. Uh, also responsible for the, I would say, prioritization, the development, uh, the implementation of the AI projects that cut across the company. So this is not like BU by BU, this is a true pan company type initiative, and that's where the focus and direction comes in from. So I, I think I'm correct in that Dell doesn't have uh, historically a chief data officer. I think Jen kind of took care of yeah. that. Uh, and so you kind of leapfrog that. Yes. So my question is, are you seeing other organizations institute similar chief uh, uh, AI officers? And then, because that gets kind of funky, right? Because you got the chief data officer, which has always been sort of, you know, an overlap with the CIO. So what are you seeing with other organizations? Uh, it's a great question. So do I see others uh, uh, having a chief AI officer? The answer is absolutely yes, it's happening. It's happening in multiple industries. So I won't or can't uh, uh, take credit for being the first, because I definitely wasn't. Uh, but I will say there, it is a morph, and I've seen, like I said before, there's people coming from the CTO side, there's people coming from the CO, CIO side, there's some people coming from the CDO side. Again, we thought it was important since it's such a big initiative that we had to have the dedicated focus and support and someone that could actually drive the transformation across the company. Um, I have to, as part of that, uh, collaborate with all my internal stakeholders. So if you think of all the functions, I don't care if it's legal or finance or sales or services or go to market or supply chain, I got to cut across everybody. Working with Jen and Dell Digital and providing a great uh, architecture and set of services for our own internal use uh, so we can have more effect there. So. 
Um, it's a, a big role that's going to cut across a lot of different functions, and I look forward to working with Jen on uh, um, moving our data strategy and our technology strategy so we can realize the potential of AI. Great. At, at, at DTW, you guys put together, put on a framework, I think there were like four pillars, your Dell's AI strategy. Yeah. Can you just sort of review that, and what's changed since since May, if anything? Sure. Uh, the strategic framework that we have that we you're referring to at Dell Tech World, we have, a, I'd say it's four key areas. It's uh, AI in, AI on, AI for, and AI with, and I'll unpack that a little bit. So if you think about AI in, that's about embedding uh, AI into our offers, uh, so they're more intelligent. And a simple example of that would be something like a Dell Optimizer, um, trying to make our, our solutions more, more efficient and autonomous by nature. Um, the secondary thing is AI on. You can think about that as us building world-class infrastructure, uh, so customers, partners could run their AI and ML workloads on our solutions. And you, an example of that would be something like Project Helix, where you know mm -hmm. uh, Dell and Nvidia, both hardware and software, came together to build a stack to help our customers really uh, drive uh, or be able to deploy um, uh, AI and Gen AI type use cases in their on-prem or, or cloud environments. Um, AI four, I really have it's a two prong for me specifically. I call it AI four, and, and the first step is that is for ourselves. And as I think about that, is it's as it's early innings here. Um, how are we using AI? Uh, capabilities, tools, uh, to help improve Dell Technologies' internal processes and business processes. They have a better uh, operational experience for our team members and, and be more effective. Uh, the secondary part of that is uh, AI uh, for our customers. And what I mean by that is taking those lesson learned, uh, those potentially best practices, um, potentially a new set of service offers we could bring to market or bring to bear for our customers to really help them on their journey. So it's really about sharing knowledge with our customers. And then lastly, the AI with, uh, you know us for a long time, we are embraced an open ecosystem mm -hmm. and this is no different. So AI with is about having strategic partners up and down the stack from hardware, software, platform layers into software. Um, aligning ourselves with uh, strategic partners to really be uh, bring a better set of solutions to our customers. So that might be software companies, LLM providers. Yeah, uh, so if you think of the stack, providers. if you think of the stack, I'll start with hardware real simplistically. If you think of the three layers of a modern AI stack, so from a hardware layer, you got infrastructure. So think of what we did with NVIDIA in our GPUs in our 9680s, right? Mm -hmm. So it's having world-class silicon and um, and our compute nodes to, to bring that as a foundational element in the hardware. In the software, you start thinking about things like uh, the, the abstraction layer and the OSs, right? It could be things we're doing with Red Hat and some other OSs, if you will. You come up the stack into the platform layer, this is where your tools and your models are there, really to make the, the day in the life of the developer much easier, right? So they can develop applications, um, uh, uh, AI and ML applications for the infrastructure or for their, for their enterprise. Um, we do partnerships with that, like say Meta with Llama 2, uh, Falcon, I mean, there's a lot of folks in that, right. in that there's a lot of people in that, in that bucket in full transparency. Dozens. <laughs> dozens. Uh, more than dozens. Yeah. Uh, and then you get up into the in the higher level stack at the application layer. And this is where we did partnerships with like folks like in the data area with like Snowflakes or, or, or even recently with Starburst, but there's so many more up there. Mm -hmm. But all the way through the stack, those are just some examples. We're going to be partnering to provide world-class solutions to our customers. The unique thing is you have to wrap that all in services because as you know right now, they're all kind of independent, independent piece parts. And our opportunity and where I think we're uniquely positioned is, is being that integrated to bring a lot of those different pieces together in that open environment. And you guys have made some announcements since May. I think there was a reference architecture. I think I saw at the financial analyst meeting some things on Apex. Yeah, uh, we've actually, there was, uh, and since DTW, I guess going back to where you were a minute ago, is that uh, that was really setting up, I would say, what I call the foundation for us to enable our customers to embrace and drive AI in their own enterprises and organizations. And I would say the key things that we did is one is we expanded our Apex offer, and that was about you know uh, business agility, uh, uh, workload flexibility, a whole bunch of things in there that we did, and, and it was great set of work by the team. In addition to that was the introduction of Project Helix. That was the work with NVIDIA, hardware, software, bringing that together for our customers. Um, the other big one was around uh, Cloud Native Edge. Uh, and I know you're going to be talking about Edge later on in the conference, but it's really building the, that software platform uh, in a in delivering it in a very uh, easy and secure way for our customers to to access data at the edge and, and use that, and then lastly was a whole suite of uh, so, uh, solutions both for AI and Gen AI solutions, and that was um, uh, it cut across multi cloud, it cut across data and data preparation, it cut across security, it's so many different areas that it cut across. So a lot of great innovation by the team to really help our customers uh, in, step forward in this journey. Just a few months, yeah, uh, yeah, things happening fast. I, I'm, I want to come back to how Dell is using AI and what you're learning. There's a lot of customers, they're experimenting, you know, they're using things like ChatGPT for yep. 
you know, marketing copy, writing code, stuff like that, but they're really trying to figure out where the value is. Where are you seeing the value? Sure, and I would say, uh, as I think about the customer landscape and kind of what's going on in the industry right now, um, what I'm seeing and the people I'm talking to across a lot of different industries, it's a, um, I'd say they're exactly right. They're in the assessing, learning, POCing kind of phase. Uh, we're all learning together. Uh, with that said, I'd say there's kind of three or four key use cases that are really developing and, and are maturing. So one is around what I call around customer operations, and that's around uh, both pre and post sales, and it's around how do we enable our agents and our customers to have a better experience. There's a whole thing around uh, what I'd say content creation and management um, in that domain. Uh, and then there's a lot of things around software product developed, uh, product, excuse me, software developer productivity. It's really about how do we make the team members more efficient in what they're doing and how they can have our developers who are, you know, highly thought of, highly paid, very talented people. They're working on the most important things versus kind of the noisy things. And we're helping do some of that stuff. Now for Dell specifically, um, we're leaning into a bunch of different use cases um, that we're driving. So in the spirit of the AI4, we have a modern, modernization effort going on and really how do we improve our entire operation? Uh, one of it's, uh, we're focused on what I call sales and go-to-market enablement. And that's really how do we enable our sellers to be more productive? How do we provide a more personalized experience for our customers um, as we go to market? The second one I would give you is around our uh, customer operations on the post-sale support. And we have doing a lot of great and interesting work. So if you think and talk to some of our customers, they'll tell you, hey, we love your support teams. Uh, we always get the right answer. Unfortunately, it, sometimes it takes too long to get to the right person or get the right answer. And we're doing some creative work with AI and Gen AI to actually flat that entire uh, ecosystem. I'm thinking about giving them a, a chat GPT or a prompt, if you will, where they can put an error log in. It can, in, in seconds, tell them through our knowledge bases, our best practices, our white paper guides, and tell them in seconds, basically, here's your error, here's the specific actions you need to take, here's a link to actually show you in the knowledge base exactly what the problem was if you want to know a reference. And there's also an opportunity if you're an agent to actually click a button and say, and I want to provide a, a customer communication on a regular interval when something happens. So we can actually take a lot of that latency and, and noise out. Uh, so those are some of the big ones we're focused on as a team. Uh, one real example, I guess a great example I can, I can give you for me in the early days, uh, one of our products, and I won't use the name, uh, had, a, had a memory leak. And, and this issue had persisted for a period of time. And it was causing some frustration with some of our big customers because they were feeling the pain. Um, in addition, it was costing uh, me a bunch of money. And what it was was is I was throwing hardware at the problem to help one of our customers because I wanted to do the right thing by them. But also taking our talented resources and say, hey, we got to go figure this out. And our teams were looking like, did I write the code wrong? Did I have a syntax issue? What, what was the problem? So this specific product actually has um, a part of it is open source and a part of it is our controlled IP. We just took the open source, we put it into a, one of the models and said, you know, just walk it and tell us if you find any issues. And it, actually within two minutes it came back and actually said, uh, told us um, you had an order of operation, more or less a more, an order of operations. We just had two of the lines. So there was no syntax issue. So our team was, look, what they were looking for was right. It was just, there was an order of operations. Do this first and then. Yes. Yeah. And that was causing the memory leak. And within two minutes, something that we'd been working on, I want to give you the whole timeline, but uh, a long time with a lot of money and a lot of frustration. Uh, we were able to find that out and root cause it in less than two minutes. We made the change that same day. Uh, we did a test and validation and I had it back in the customer's hands with a fix in less than two weeks. Um, so that to me was the aha. Wow, that's game amazing. Moment. And, and back to what you were saying before about the customer and the, the, the service capability. So the, the customer who doesn't get an immediate response, he or she might be start, they might Google it, they're not sure if the response is accurate. They're waiting for, for a response to frustrate. So the value there is obviously the customer satisfaction, but it's also the cost of doing that service drops right to the bottom line. So those are the types of use cases that I, I would expect are gonna really gonna start driving AI to gain share. In other words, I'm spending on AI, I'm getting value, now let's spend more. It might even trickle back to <laughs> some of the other initiatives yeah. that, to your point, Rises all ships. It rises all ships, it absolutely does. And we definitely see it as an impact on customer experience, which we think will have a direct impact on stickiness and revenue opportunities as we go forward. Uh, we definitely see uh, benefits in regards to productivity for our customers and for ourselves, which then they can figure out how do you want to take those resources and redeploy them, right? And some of that could go back to a PL to be more profitable. Some of that could go back to investing in future uh, innovation or just on higher valued projects versus kind of the, the noisy projects. So a lot of opportunity there. I want to bring up the power law of, of Gen AI that we developed, um, I don't know, a couple months ago. 
And what this shows is in the vertical axis is the size of the model. So you've got the big cloud guys, you've got the Llama 2s, you've got OpenAI, and, you know, kind of on the left-hand side. And then the, on the horizontal axis is the model specificity. And that orange line is a sort of historical example of the music industry where you had very few music labels dominated the industry and you had a really long tail. And our premise is with all this open source, you can see those red lines, it's pulling you know, to democratize AI. And then you see in the middle there on premises, the, the special specialized AI, that model, highly domain specific models. And that's what you just described. You're using your data. Now, my question is, will that, our premises, it'll happen on, on prem. Yeah, of course it's self-serving, but will that happen on prem? Are you talking to customers about, hey, I don't want that IP leakage. I want to do this you know, in my own estate. I think it could be more cost effective, safer, more secure. What are you hearing from customers here? Yeah, I'd say uh, the big thing I'm hearing from customers is it's, uh, it's, as I said, early innings and it's still immature, I guess, in its nature and the enterprises truly haven't seen the benefits yet because they're working through this. Um, I would say the biggest th trend or thing I'm hearing from customers is that they're concerned a, lot, a handful of things in full transparency. One is about complexity. Uh, two is around talent. Do we have the right talent that actually could do the data prep, or could I do the, um, you know, the the build the model, train the model, tune the model, prompt the model, what have you? Um, <clears throat> in addition to that, the concern about security, right? And now, is this a, a tax service bigger or not? And the biggest thing they're talking to me about is IP control, kind of where you just ended. Mm -hmm. uh, so they are worried about all that stuff, and they're realizing. Uh, there's an opportunity here in regards to that they could do it a lot more cost effectively and have a lot more uh, control over their data and their security and their IP control if they do it on smaller models, on-prem models, with some of these open source tools that allow them to go do that. And that's something that they're all leaning into. So I would say to you right now, uh, as, as we've talked about in the past, all data is not created equal. Uh, it is a hybrid world, so I do see a hybrid AI world as well. And depending on the use case, uh, the value of that use case and where you can get the best service if that's in a cloud or in a colo or an on-prem type environment, I do think we're going to see a hybrid model. I do believe more of that because of the critical IP, I think more than 80% of the world's most critical IP is still on-prem. I think that it plays to our hand and to your point, um, it's a huge opportunity. So you described earlier that sort of modern data stack. I'm comfortable that the, the, the core infrastructure and the OSs, there's plenty of that that you can bring on on-prem that's world-class. Are you confident that the, the the tools and the models and the LLMs that you'll be able to, to bring that to create as rich of an experience as the cloud guys? Uh, the answer, we have to, right? In the, in the, in the quick and dirty, but it's uh, we have to have an easy button. We have to make it a simple on-ramp for our customers so they actually can do what they want to do, which is keep their critical IP on-prem. So the answer is, I think we can with the open models. You know, you, you, you made the comment about uh, how do we democratize certain things, and you and I were talking before, you know, one of the things that I have in my head is, you know, some, one of the defining technologies of our time was the World Wide Web in 1989, and that democratized, you know, uh, the access to information. And what I'm seeing with AI, and specifically Gen AI, that's changing the game. It's democratizing everyone and all of our opportunity to use AI, um, and so it's democratizing AI and usage. In addition to that though, it's actually democratizing, Gen AI specifically is democratizing um, our opportunity to use that information or that data in a more um, uh, impactful uh, way for our, for our, for our organizations, for, for each other in our day and life. So I think that creates just tremendous opportunity and all these different tools, you know, you're going to see innovation continue to happen. It's still early. So I'm seeing innovation in the silicon layer and the hardware. So you think about the NVIDIA's, the AMD's and the Intel's, there's about 30 or 40 other startups I'm tracking in that space that are all doing some unique and interesting things depending on the use case. Some of that's on, the, you know, on the big stuff that we're doing with large language models. Other stuff is going on the small models. Uh, some of it's going for inferencing, especially at the edge and other things, I think at RAG and inferencing. So a lot of stuff going on in that space. You come up the stack and you think about the closed models or the open models. You think about what Meta did with Llama 2, some really cool stuff going on in there and what you can do. Uh, obviously what OpenAI has been doing, there's just so much innovation happening. There's a lot of startups in that space that are actually doing some really cool things on how to, what I would call, going back to my old storage days, we talked about data efficiencies where you would compress and dedupe and thin things. They're actually doing that to the models to make mm -hmm. them thinner and easier so you don't need big, huge resources to drive some of this stuff. And just, it's just, we're in the early innings. And you're going to see so much innovation. I innovation, ex 
Belosian, uh, Jeff Boudreaux, congratulations on, on the new role. You got to be super excited. What to give you? I'll give you the last word. I uh, just, hey, I, I, I think it's, uh, first, thank you for having me. Let's start with that. You bet. It's, more, it's more important. Uh, and I just want everybody to understand that I do believe in the, that this is a, a important period in time. I think AI is going to change the game in regards to how we work and, and, and how we live. Um, I am, a, a, as we say at Dell, but I'm, an, I'm a technology optimist. I truly believe it can help us make the world a better place and help really drive uh, human progress in a better way. And I want to be very clear, Dell, we will not be sitting on the sidelines. Just like every other technology transition, we will be at the forefront. We will be help, standing side by side with our customers and we will help them bring this open ecosystem together so they can benefit in the most uh, um, beneficial way to them and their customers. Fantastic. All right, Jeff, thanks again. Thank you. All right, and thanks for watching SuperCloud 4. We'll be right back with more live and on-demand content from our studios in Palo Alto with John Furrier, Rob Strecce, and myself. More great conversations around AI. Keep it right there.